broadcast of Calvary Compassion Church. You're listening to Pastor Teddy Sanders. Let's join him as he teaches verse by verse from the Word of God. Luke chapter 15. Let's pray first. Father, as uh, we just sang, Lord God, Father, you are more than enough. Lord, everything that we need, we know it's within you. Father, for you declared that you are the great I am. And Lord, uh, I personally, and I'm sure others in the congregation, Lord, has experienced you in many different ways. And Lord, once again, even when we are not faithful, Lord, you prove to be faithful. Father, your love exceeds anything that we have ever known and could ever know. Lord, we loved you, but we know it was you who first loved us. Father, as we now look to open up your word and, Father, to go through the scriptures, Lord, may we hear what the Spirit has to say to us as individuals as well as collectively as your, as your church. And, Father, may we be found doers of your word and not hearers only. So, Father, clear all distractions and, Father, anything that will prohibit us from receiving your word, Lord, where the enemy would want to come in and snatch that seed away. Lord, may your word be planted upon the fertile soil of our hearts, Lord God. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come together as the body of Christ. And Lord, not only bless in our church, but Lord, each and every church who is meeting right now, Lord God. Father, we know it's not just about us, but it's about the universal church. And so Lord, we pray for those churches and those individuals as well. And Lord, uh, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Luke chapter 15. Now, as we begin to, to, to look at these scriptures, we're going to see that this is one parable, keep this in mind, it is one parable, but there are three distinct stories in this parable. The, the first part of the, the parable we're going to see is the, the shepherd, uh, uh, the first section which will demonstrate the heart of God, the Son, Jesus. The second portion, we're going to look at the woman with, with the lost coin, and the second section demonstrates the work of God as the Holy Spirit, illumination. And then the, the final section of, of this parable is the Father, which is going to, of course, demonstrate the heart of God the Father. Now, let's look at the, the lost sheep. Now, the sheep was lost due to its own foolishness. Anybody ever been there? You, you, we make some stupid choices and done some bad things, but God in his faithfulness uh, stepped in and, and does what he does. Verse 1. It says, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable of them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until it finds us. So, you know, Jesus was accused, and you know what? That's a great accusation to have where he sat with sinners. Sinners were attracted to him. And you know what? He just expounded on the things of God, and we know that the re religious community didn't like that because they didn't associate with, remember, sinners or, or those who were had some type of illness or infirmity, and of course they didn't associate with women at all. But Jesus is coming and he's breaking up all those misnomers that the religious community had, and you know, the sinners were attracted to him. You know, a lot of times we, we have a, 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 a description of Jesus where, you know what, he's just ho-hum, and you know, no, Jesus was the life of the party. That's why he was always invited to parties. He was always invited to dinners, not only of sinners, but of, of the religious community. And once again, Jesus did not hate the religious community because we know according to John 3, 16, God so loved the world, and that encompasses the religious community of, the, of his day. But Jesus, you know, he, he hung around with the, those who were hurting and those who was lost. He even goes to say, you know, he said, I didn't come to minister to those who are well. You know, those who are well need no physician, but those who are sick. And so Jesus came to minister to those who were lost. And we see here one of the descriptions of Jesus throughout the scriptures. He's known as the shepherd. Over in John chapter 10, verse 11, that's John chapter 10, verse 11. It states, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus also is referred to as the chief shepherd over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. You can write that down and go and reference that later. That's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. And so we, we see here the heart 
of the shepherd, the heart of Jesus. You know, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Let's pick up verse 5. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. We have all been a wayward sheep. Isn't that safe to say? At some point in our time, we've all been a wayward sheep. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. It says, For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, Pastor Jim did probably one of the best teachings I've ever heard on the 23rd Psalm. And, and you know, as it talks about sheep and what you have to understand is what was going on in that culture and even still what happens today is that, you know, when a sheep strays off, the reason why it's important to gather that sheep is because what would happen? The other sheep would follow as well. And so when a shepherd had a sheep that would keep wandering off, eventually what would happen is he would go after that sheep. Of course, he would leave that, that, the 99, as in Scripture, with another shepherd. And then he would go after the one. And eventually what would happen if that sheep continues to wander off and continues to wander off, after he retrieves it, after that last time, what he would do is he would break the leg of the sheep. Now, some of you may say, well, that's just so cruel. But what happens is that once that, that, that the shepherd breaks the sheep's leg, he places the sheep around his neck. And everywhere that, you know, he would take the, the herd of sheep, you know, he would carry this one. And so that sheep would be so familiar and so comfortable with the shepherd that it would prohibit that sheep from wandering off from the flock. Psalms 119, 67. Psalms 119, verse 67. It says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. In other words, to paraphrase that, Lord, uh, b- before I had to adhere to your word and to live according to your word, I was out here acting a doggone fool. And you know what? I didn't like the way that things were going. And so, Lord, I had no choice but to come to the one who's trusted, the one who is faithful. How many of us have been there? Don't raise your hand, but I raise my hand for you. I've been there. I've been that wayward sheep. We've all been that wayward sheep. And somehow, because of the situations that I found myself in, that we found, find ourselves in, when we walk away from the things of God, things get difficult, don't they? They get difficult. Then. And so, Something inside, the spirit of the living God will say, you know what, and we're going to see this later on in the Bible lesson, is that, you know what, I, I had it better when I was at my father's house. You know, I, you know although I, I have this relationship with the Lord and, you know, people t- tend to believe and others tend to teach that once you give your life to the Lord, that things are going to be groovy. And that's not always the case. If anything, things are going to get turned up in your life. You know what, but our relationship shouldn't be based solely upon what's going on around us because people come to church for many different reasons. You know, they're looking for answers. They're, they're hurting or whatever it, it may be. But just know that I, and I believe I can speak on your behalf as well, is that, you know, I would rather go through a difficult situation with Jesus than go through a difficult situation without Jesus. I've tried it my way, and my way did not work. But listen, when you try God, and you live according to his word, and he began to show you just how much he loves you and just how, how faithful he is, you know, to your situation. Man, I tell you that I only have one regret in life, and that's I didn't serve the Lord all my life because God is faithful even when we are not. Let's pick up verse 6. It says, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. How many of you you really believe that, you know, when a sinner comes to repentance that the angels are, are, are singing and angels are rejoicing. We know it from Scripture, but you know what? We have to be a church, you know what, that, that's encompassing of getting outside of these walls and, and sharing our faith wherever we find ourselves, whether it's in your home, in your neighborhood, on your job. As Pastor Corey alluded to earlier, you know, wherever you may go, it's a breeding ground for lost people. And you know, all we have to do is just share what the Lord has done for us, and you know, we leave the rest up to Him. But the angels rejoice when a sinner repents. The lost coin. 
Now, we see that the sheep wandered off because of foolishness. And now we're going to see the lost coin. This coin was lost due to the carelessness of another. Pick up verse 8. It says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweeps the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Now, in that culture, and even today, when a Jewish girl got married, she would wear a headband of ten silver coins to show that she was now wife. It was the Jewish version of our modern-day wedding ring, and it would be considered a catastrophic for her to lose one of those coins, and that's what happened in the story. Let's pick up verse 9. Now, once again, remember, this is demonstrating the illumination of the Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I kind of saw something similar to this on Friday. You know, my wife and I, um, we were getting ready to, to go to a wedding. And I was officiating the, the ceremony. And so, you know, my wife, she's dressed and she's beautiful. And so now she has to put on the ladies, you, I don't know what y'all call it, but I call it the finishing touches, you know, where she, she's accessorizing her jewelry to match her outfit. Well, I, I hear all this fumbling and bumbling, and I hear her moaning and groaning and fussing at the sink. And I'm like, you know, what's wrong? And she's like, I, you know, I dropped the earring down the sink. And I'm like, oh, wow. Come on, let's go. Um, but, you know, she was, she was distraught. Now, I, I could only imagine if it was the wedding ring or if it was uh, something of great, great value. But, you know, to, to magnify her situation with What's going on in our story is that, you know, this was intense. This was intense. And so we see that, you know, she, she swept, she lit lamps and everything that she could do to find this lost coin. And, and that's what the Lord does through the spirit of the living God with us is that, you know, he, he sets a, a, a light in our hearts. You know, think about this. If we were to shut off all of the, the lights in the auditorium, it, of course, we know it would be pitch black, right? And what most of us would do now time is we would immediately go to our cell phones and what? We are cut on a flashlight to give some light. So it makes visibility a little bit better. But just imagine if all of us who had cell phones that have a, a, a light on it, if we cut on all our lights at the same time, it would make this place that was once in darkness a little bit more visible for us to see and to maneuver. And that's what's going on here in our story, especially as it relates to the woman in the coin. But there's something else that the Lord revealed to me. Note that the coin was lost in the house. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the coin. Okay, let, okay, time out. Time out. Remember, we, we come from a Baptist background, Pastor Corey and I, and I'm sure most of you too, right? And so you know that when I talk to you, it's okay for you to talk back to me, right? To my white brothers and sisters, that may be alarming, but that's what usually happens in the predominantly black churches. I'm going to talk to you, and it's okay for you to talk back to me. So, let's try this again. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to say, neighbor, the coin was lost in the house. The coin was lost in the house. Listen, going to church will not save you. Going to church will not save you, just like standing in the garage won't transform you into a car. All right? It is possible that someone is in the house, but you are lost. Now, how does a person get saved? We must all realize that we are sinners and that we need forgiveness. We are not worthy of God's grace. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, through Jesus Christ, he gave us a way to be saved from our sins. God showed us his love by giving us the potential for life through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
paraphrase, what does that mean? While you were at your worst, Christ died for you. While I was at my worst, Christ died for me. Now, if we remain sinners, we will die in our sins and we will be in hell. However, if we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and repent and repent of our sins, we will have eternal life. That word repent means to, to turn around from your sinful life and to live according to the Scriptures. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, when we confess that Jesus is, the, is our Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you and I will and are saved. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And there is no religious formula or ritual all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved according to Romans chapter 10 verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? So we see the heart of the shepherd, which is Jesus. We see the work of the Holy Spirit, which he, he illuminates, he brings things to light in our lives. You know, he brings things that are contrary to the word of God, and then we are to repent once he shows us those things, and then we are to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. And then the last story in this parable is that of the prodigal son. Now, the son was lost because of pure rebellion, of pure rebellion. Let's pick up verse 11. And then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And in essence, what, what's happening is that the son is wishing that the father was dead because it wasn't uncommon for a father during that time to give his inheritance to his son, but what is saying and what is implied here is that this son is saying, Dad, I wish you was dead. Give me the stuff. Here's my question to you. Do you want the goods or do you want our God? Do you want the goods or do you want our God? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You know, a, a, a lot of times, especially with the prosperity gospel, the name it and claim it, the blab it and grab it, is that, you know, they teach you that, you know, you're supposed to get the stuff. And that's not always accurate. You know what? Your desire and my desire is to, to have fellowship and to commune with our Lord. He desires to spend time with us each and every day. However long you want to spend time with them, he's longing to spend time for you. And then the stuff will come. We just read it in Scripture. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek God first, and then all these other things shall be added to you. Verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Prodigal simply means wasteful. In other words, he was turned up. Ain't that what the young folks say? To me, is that what the young folks say? Huh? Okay, so he was, he was getting turned up, y'all. Verse 14, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Bible, for, and for those of us who, who is, for a Jew to be associated with feeding pigs, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a very bad thing. Verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the paws that the swine ate, and no one underlined this, circle it, highlight it. No one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. Here's my question when I read this story. Where in the world was his friends. When he had the possessions and he was getting turned up, 
Man, I bet they were flocking around, but then when he fell on hard times because something that was out of his control, a famine hit the land, but he had to spend up all his money that he had. Where was his friends? Proverbs chapter 19, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 4. It says, wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his friends. And in verse 7 of Proverbs chapter 19, it says, all the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do this, do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. Here's a, something for not only the young folks here, but also the older ones as well. When things are going good for you, people tend to flock around you. You know what? If you were to win the lottery, you're going to have family and friends come out of the woodworks that you didn't even know existed. But as soon as that money's gone... They gone too. They are gone too. But let's concentrate here. It says, no one gave him anything. Write this down. No one enabled him. You know, as we see our loved ones going through difficulties because of their bad choices, it's hard to watch, but they have to hit rock bottom in order for them to see the rock. And that rock, of course, is Jesus Christ. Verse 17. But when he had came to himself, when he, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And, and I perish with hunger. I'm so hungry, y'all. But no one gave him nothing. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Notice that the father didn't go out after him. It wasn't until he hit rock bottom that he remembered how good he had it in his father's house. We talked about that earlier. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, in the East, old men don't run because it wasn't considered graceful. Yet the father ran to meet his son. Why? One reason was his love for him and his desire to show him that love. Another reason is there is something else that was involved, right? What? According to Deuteronomy chapter 21, write this down. According to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 21, when you had a wayward child and they wouldn't follow the instructions that the parents would give him, guess what would happen? That child, that rebellious child would be taken out of the gates of the city, and there he would be stoned. So, think about this. The father ran out to meet him when he saw him afar off. Why? Because when he embraced him, if the community would stone the son, they would have to have stoned the father as well. That's the type of God that we, we serve, the type of God that loves us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God desires to, to run after you. You know, we were singing a song, we chasing after God. Listen, we have a responsibility, right? Man's responsibility, then God's responsibility. I don't know how it all works. I just know that it does. And so... While we were at our worst, while we are prodigal sons and prodigal daughters, God loved us while we were at our worst. Great illustration here in our Bible lesson. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and no longer worthy to be called your son. But listen to this. I love this. But the father said to his servant, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. We've been a party because my son has returned back to me for this. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost 
and is found, and they begin to be merry. I'm going to stop right there for a few minutes. How many of us have prodigal children, grandchildren, or we know someone close to us? And I'm going to be transparent here with you all and I'm going to share a little bit about my wife and I and our history. My oldest son, who's now 32, his name is Theodore. When he was 15, he decided that he loved the world more than he loved anything else. And he began to do things contrary to the law. Now, mind you, I was a leader in the church. I had not accepted a call to the pastor yet, but I was a leader in the church, and I was a, a juvenile probation officer. And I was a very good juvenile probation officer. I was multiple times employee of the month. I was recognized in the courts and, and you know, in that arena in Palm Beach County. And I always made it my business not to let my employment or what I did as my vocation interfere with my family. So all of the time and energy that I would pour into those young men and those young women and, and, and helping them, I made sure that I poured just as much into my own children, you know, so that there wouldn't be an excuse where, you know, you do more for them than you do for me. And so even with that, he just decided that he wanted to be rebellious. He, he was not disrespectful per se to me and my wife, but once he got outside of the walls of our home, man, he was doing some things that he, he should not have been doing. And, you know, as a parent recognizing the community and in the courts, you know, I, I was embarrassed. I, I just was really embarrassed. And it was probably the lowest points, one of the lowest points of my life. Here I am, a pillar in the community, a pillar in the church, and here's my son, just totally rebellion, totally rebellion. And I can remember it was so bad. I would remember uh, uh, going into Riviera Beach, and I remember I'm, I'm in my truck, and I see him, and I see some other young men, and they're, they're running and they're jumping from building to building. And, you know, they're, he, he's trying to escape my line of sight. And I remember I was just so embarrassed and, and so dejected because he has chosen to live his life that way. And here I am, and, you know, before uh, the, the judge that I would be there to represent other juveniles with, I'm now standing before the judge with my son because eventually he got arrested. And, you know, I, I was just so embarrassed. I was just really outdone. And I remember this one particular night, I was, I was driving on the Congress Bridge. Anybody familiar with Riviera Beach, you know what I'm talking about. I was on what was 8th Street, now MLK, and, you know, that Congress Bridge. And I remember, I'm like, you know what, I, 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 I've had it. You know, I'm going to drive off the side of the bridge. And there are many times that I have heard the audible voice of God. Normally, it's an unction or, you know, it's a leading of the Spirit. But this is the very first time that I've heard the audible voice of the Lord. And this is what that voice said to me. He says, if you drive off of this bridge, that will not glorify me. That will glorify you. And it was, and you know what? It snapped me out of that moment of depression. But I was just so embarrassed because he just chose to live outside of the boundaries of everything that I believed and what I believed that the Lord could do for him. But here's something that I learned. When I read this passage, I had read this passage of Scripture numerous times, numerous times. And then one day, just like the illumination of the coin in the house, the Lord gave me the illumination of this from the Scriptures. And that verse that said, and no one gave him anything. Now, parents, I know it's difficult when we see our children and our loved ones going through difficult things. But here's something that the Lord revealed to me as well. The lesson that I was preventing him from learning at 15 and 16, he still had to learn that lesson. And I would have rather him learn that lesson at 15 and 16 as opposed to 26. And so my father-in-law said something to me, and it shook me to my core. We were talking one day. We were in Georgia. And he said, son, let me tell you something. He said, put insurance on him and then put him in the hands of God. And I'm like, man, that's heavy. 
That's heavy, but it was so true. God can do more with his life than I ever could have. And just because it was his folly, it wasn't my mistake. And so I didn't have to wear or carry that burden of the embarrassment. Now, I'm just being real. That's how I felt. I was just embarrassed. But I didn't have to carry that around because he was at the age where I poured into him. He knew right from wrong, but he chose to make those bad decisions. And so I had two other kids who were in the home at the time. They were younger, and they're watching this. And it got to the point where I'm like, you know what? For the sake of my household, you got to go. And I put him out at 16, changed the locks. Now, some of you saying, that's just too harsh. Well, let me tell you something. It is Bible because the purest form of love in Genesis, the day that you, tru- the day that you eat up this fruit, you shall surely die. And they chose, Adam and Eve, to eat of the forbidden fruit. Love in its purest form now says you have to get out. You have to get out of the garden. And to make sure that you can't find your way back to it, I'm going to put an angel with a a flaming sword at the entrance. Love in its purest form also has consequences. So for those of us who have prodigal children, prodigal grandchildren, or you know someone that's close to you, listen. The scripture says, and no one gave them anything. We are not to enable our children. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, it was hard. But Lord, it was necessary. Because see, what's going to happen with the prodigals is you're going to hear one of two things. Why did you let me do it? Or I thank you that you did it. Now, my son has grown. He has his own family. He's a leader on his job. He's a wonderful husband and a wonderful father. And I get this phone call every so often. Dad, I thank you that you were tough on me. He says, while I was going through it, he says, I hated you. Well, number one, I'm not trying to be your buddy. And parents, if you're out here and you're trying to be friends with your children, you are to be their parent first. Friendship comes later. Friendship comes later. And now he praises me and my wife for being tough on him. Was it hard? Yes. There were some days she would be crying. I'm like, get out the house. I'm like, leave the house. Because I'm going to do some things to him. And I disciplined him. Now, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not, we're called to discipline our children. We're not to beat them to death. But here's the thing. The Bible says that we are to do what? Being a sapling, watch young. Because see, what happens is, you know what, when we see our little kids, right, and, you know, they're doing grownish things, and you're like, oh, that's so cute. Little kids grow up to be adult children. And so if you don't bend them while they're young, they're going to embarrass you when they're older, right? We are not called to be friends with our children. We're called to parent our children. We're called to, to admonish them in the things of God. And I'm telling you, it was difficult. It was difficult, but through Christ Jesus, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is nothing impossible with God. And so, man, it was just a tough place to be in. But because of God and his grace and his infinite love, you know what? He touched his heart, my prodigal. And all of us have been prodigals. We not might have been in the same form and fashion as the prodigal in our story. But the Bible teaches there is no one who does good, no, not one. And then because of the wooing of the Holy Spirit, because of the the illumination of the Holy Spirit, he illuminates the darkness in our lives with the things of light. And then what happens as we begin to walk with the Lord and we begin to love the Lord and want to be obedient to the Lord, the Holy Spirit, he illuminates those areas in our lives where he says, you know what, this is not right according to the Word of God because the Word of God is the standard. And we repent, Lord, I'm sorry for that thing that I'm doing or that thing that I have done. Lord, would you forgive me? And the Bible says, 1 John 1 and 9, it says that when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us all unrighteousness. Right? And, and then we get to experience the fatted calf. 
We don't have to wait to heaven. We can experience the fatted calf. Jesus said, I come that you may have what? Life and have it abundantly. We get to experience abundant life, not only in heaven, but while we're here. Right? And, and so that's part of that fellowship. And, and what sin does, what sin does is it creates a barrier, right, to where we may be believers, right? But when we walk in sin, listen, the psalmist says that the Lord doesn't even hear your prayers. We have to repent. Repent is a word that we as the body of Christ have to use, and we have to use it frequently. What you're doing, if it's wrong according to the standards of God, you need to repent. You need to adhere to what the Word of God teaches, and we need to live according to what the Word of God teaches. All of us are prodigals. And, you know, when my son was going through all these things that he was going through, you know, it, it was tough. It was tough to receive him again. You know what? But here, this is what I remember. The Lord had forgiven me of the things that I've done wrong. Who am I not to forgive him? To welcome him back into the family, back into the fold of our family. And so that's the story of my prodigal son. And he's doing well right now. He's doing great. Great boss, great husband, great father. And he attributed to tough love. And you all remember that. Do not enable your children, your friends, your spouse, whoever it may be. Put them in the hands of God. Stand back and watch what he does. If they have to hit rock bottom, they have to hit rock bottom. And I was blessed because what he did didn't end in death. I was blessed because what he did didn't end in death. Listen, when we were in court with my son, the gentleman came up to me. He said, Theodore, he said, if he was not your son, I would have killed him. And we began to thank the Lord and praise God. Like I said, it was no fun being in the courtroom. It was no fun watching him go through those things. It was no fun seeing him in juvie jail. But it was necessary. Remember, the lessons that you try to prevent them from learning, they eventually have to learn. So it's best that you let them learn it now as opposed to later. Amen? And I'm going to stop right there. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you for the encouragement, brother. Father, we do thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your infinite love that you have toward us, Lord. And Father, your word declares that while we were still sinners, you demonstrated your love for us by down on the cross for us. Lord, at one time or another, all of us were prodigal sons and daughters. But Lord, you made a way through your son, Jesus Christ, who gave up the abode of heaven, took on the form of a bond servant, lived a sinless life, died a criminal's death, was put in a borrowed tomb. But oh God, on the third day, you arose with all power and authority. We know that you are now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, making intercession on behalf of the saints. And so, Lord, we look to you for strength. We look to you for courage. Lord, we hand over all of the prodigals in our lives to you, Lord God. Father, that they may see you and you alone. Father, it's difficult and it's hard, you know. But, Lord, we do believe that it is necessary. Father, by any means necessary. Help us to labor on our knees for those individuals and even for ourselves. God, we glorify you because we're not deserving of anything that you had to offer us. But for some reason, you have chosen to do so. You even declare that we are the apple of your eye. And, Lord, we can't fathom the heights nor the depth of just how much you love us. But, Lord, what we do know, we are thankful for. You're gracious, you're merciful, and you continue to be long-suffering. God, we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.